and welcome to today's America Walks webinar titled Dangerous by Design, Transportation Officials Discuss What's Wrong with Arterials. Next slide, please. My name's Ian Thomas, State and Local Program Director with America Walks. Taking care of the technology is my colleague, Kate Spielmaker, Communications Manager. And helping facilitate the discussion will be America Walks board member, Ashton Simpson, who is also Executive Director of Oregon Walks and a member elect of the Oregon Metro Council. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, without whom these webinars would not be possible. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and their Active People Healthy Nation program, as well as EcoCounter and Tool Design. And I invite you to consider supporting our work too. America Walks is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And Kate has put a link to our donations page in the chat window. If you can, please help us continue to provide high quality programming focused on creating walkable communities. We appreciate audience participation. So please put your comments and questions in the Q&A window and we'll address as many of those as we can. I also want to note that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So to today's webinar, earlier this year, Smart Growth America published their latest edition of Dangerous by Design, showing that pedestrian fatalities in the US increased by 5% in 2020 and are projected to shoot up another 11% in 2021. Most of these tragic deaths are occurring on one specific type of roadway, one which only makes up a small fraction of the nation's transportation network. So in this webinar, we're gonna ask what's wrong with arterials and how can we fix them? To answer these questions, we have a panel of experts who have committed their careers to improving transportation safety. Beth Osborne is Vice President of Transportation and Thriving Communities for Smart Growth America and lead author of Dangerous by Design. Billy Hathaway worked for 28 years with the Florida Department of Transportation and also served as Director of Transportation for the City of Orlando. And he's now a consultant with Fair and Peers. Tok Somishakin is the Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency and an America Walks board member whose career as a transportation planner has focused on multimodal systems and transportation safety. Tokes and Billy are working in the most affected areas of the country as seven of the most deadly metro regions are in California and Florida. Seven of the 10 most. We'll hear from them shortly, but first I'd like to ask you Beth to get us started with an overview of the report. Let me just uh, share my screen. All right. Well, thank you all so much for having me and for profiling this really uh, important report. Uh, it's something we're super proud of. We started doing Dangerous by Design uh, way back in, I believe, 2008 or 2009. Um, I do want to first uh, introduce Smart Growth America, which is a national nonprofit, focuses very much on the built environment, whether that be transportation or land use, uh, housing, or any other part of the built environment. And our goal is to create communities that are healthy, prosperous, and resilient. Dangerous by Design uh, normally comes out every other year. Uh, our last one came out in 2019 but, or I'm sorry, uh, last year, 2021, covering the 2019 data. But 2020 was such an interesting year, we couldn't let that one go by. And we really wanted to dig in and learn uh, more about what happened in that, uh, unfortunately, record-breaking, dangerous year. So the results, Ian has already referred to, shows that uh, we had a huge jump in pedestrian fatalities. As you can see from this, uh, graphic, they were increasing um, 
over uh, a decade. They, they've been consistently going up and the projected increase for 2021, those data are not fully available yet, but you can see it's another massive increase. We've, we've seen a 62% increase in people struck and killed while walking between 2009 and 2020. Um, and uh, both 2020 and 2021 were record breaking um, uh, in terms of the increase. We also see that Black and Native Americans are significantly more likely to be killed while walking, and we'll dig into that a little bit more. Here's some really interesting findings. Uh, normally, we look at people's exposure to danger while walking, and we base that on how many people in a region walk to work. Well, you might remember in 2020, we didn't have a, a, a typical year of going to work, so that was not a useful measure. Uh, we instead collaborated with Streetlight Data to learn about general walking patterns over 2020. Um, what we discovered was demand for walking increased across the board. Every single community saw a huge increase in uh, walking. Um, only some areas got more deadly, and they were the areas that tended to have uh, lower shares of people walking to work before the pandemic and were already more deadly. Those that uh, had a higher share of people walking to work sometimes saw uh, a, an improvement in danger. They saw a lowering of fatalities. Um, and I will also point out that while driving went down across the world, remember this was a worldwide pandemic, of the developed countries, only three saw an increase in fatalities. The United States, Switzerland, and Ireland, but Switzerland and Ireland saw a, a way smaller increase and they started from a way smaller baseline. So the U.S. suffered the same thing others did, but turned it into much worse news. These are the top 20 most dangerous metros as of 2020. Uh, one thing that we saw is uh, everyone above that dotted line to the right was more deadly than what was the top most deadly community five years ago. Uh, it's just an extraordinary increase uh, in, in danger across the most dangerous cities. In terms of the most dangerous states, uh, this is what we see and you will notice uh, on the graph to the right that uh, the difference in the average fatality rate from 2011 to 15 versus 2016 to 20 I mean, every state except for Delaware saw a massive increase. Delaware had done a lot of its increasing already, unfortunately, and still ranks very much near the top. People of color are much more likely to die when walking. We see uh, Black Americans are twice as likely to be struck and killed while walking as white Americans, and Native Americans are three times more likely. This is likely due to the fact that Black and Native Americans are more likely to have no access to a vehicle, but they're also more likely to live in a community where the roads are not built for the people who live there, but for people who are coming from a neighborhood uh, outside of, of the one the, the roadway is going through, and they're trying to get someplace on the other side of that community. So it's not the people being exposed to danger that are being served by the road. There is an incredible relationship between wealth and exposure uh, to danger when walking. Uh, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to uh, be exposed to danger. The wealthier you are, the less likely you are. This is again likely due to who has access to a functioning automobile and not just a functioning automobile, but one functioning automobile per person over 16 in the household and who has the political wherewithal to fight for traffic calming where they live. Now, in terms of what's wrong with the arterials, I know that my uh, fellow panelists are gonna dig deeper into this, but we looked particularly at a roadway in um, uh, Memphis. And, and I don't mean to pick on Memphis or uh, uh, this particular roadway. It's just one that we could find a good uh, aerial picture of. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's typical of what we see across the country. I will point out, this is not even close 
to the most dangerous. Uh, when I look at it, I notice that the buildings are actually much closer to the roadway than is typical in a lot of suburban settings. That's a good thing uh, because the more hemmed in people feel, the more likely they are to drive slower uh, and drive the actual speed limit. But otherwise, you see what we typically see with arterials. We see a very straight roadway. Uh, we see really very few obstructions along the way that would tell you you're going to need to slow down or stop. Uh, and uh, yet we see many points of potential conflict. Every driveway, every cross street is a place of conflict while the driver has been built for them a speedway. This is what a racetrack looks like, but racetracks don't have places where cars or people or other things can suddenly show up in their space. And it is the combination of building a speedway in an area of substantial conflict points that really makes that roadway a recipe for, for uh, uh, crashes, for mistakes, and for deadly mistakes. And I will finish by just pointing out again that arterials are where most fatalities happen. 60% of 2020 deaths occurred on non-interstate arterial highways like this. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important to say we knew that these roadways were more likely to be dangerous when there was not traffic way back years and years ago. You saw most fatal crashes happen in off-peak times when people went the speed that the roadway allowed. Congestion stops that. Well, in 2020, the congestion went away all around the clock and we saw speeds increase. In 2021, we did see more people start driving again, but we didn't see them come back in the peak times the way we were used to in 2019. And therefore speeds were higher all day long because that's how the roadway is built to encourage and support high speed vehicles. And with that, I am going to hand things over to Billy and uh, trade back the uh, stream, uh, screen sharing to you. Um, and Billy Hathaway is someone I've had the pleasure to work with a whole bunch. And in uh, several technical assistances that we've done with states and localities. Um, so uh, you'll, I can tell you, you will enjoy his presentation. Go ahead, Billy. Thank you, Beth. Um, as Beth said, we have been fortunate to work together. Uh, in fact, I was recruited back to Florida Department of Transportation at the end of 2011 because of the 2011 Dangerous by Design report. Uh, and I was recruited back specifically to lead our Southwest Florida district, but also to focus Florida Departments uh, of Transportation efforts on uh, dealing with dangerous by design uh, by leading the pedestrian and bicycle safety initiative, which I did for five years, and also use the report as a means to uh, develop a complete streets policy, which has actually been fully implemented into Florida Department of Transportation's uh, policy and design guidance. Uh, after working at the department for that five years, I uh, because I lived in Orlando, um, I uh, went uh, was had the opportunity to become the transportation director at the city of Orlando, and we had six commissioner districts, uh, half of which were very uh, affluent and well educated, and six, and three that were communities of concern, uh, where we had uh, less uh, income and a large numbers of people who did not have a way to get around. Uh, so I was able to go to the mayor having already worked at DOT on the safety initiative and I was very much attracted to uh, the Vision Zero Safe Systems approach. So I worked with the leadership and city staff and a number of stakeholders to develop a policy to el eliminate traffic, and, uh, traffic deaths and uh, serious injuries within the city. And we actually developed a Vision Zero Action Plan as the result of those efforts. And if I get my slide to change here, there we go. 
Uh, and you can see, I won't go through all the detail, but you can see that during the three years that, uh, that our consultant analyzed, and they looked at all six commissioner districts, I asked them specifically to break down the fatalities and serious injuries by commissioner districts so that I would have specific data to represent the challenges that we faced. And you can see we had 61 fatalities during that time, but we also had 2,800 uh, uh, a combination of 2,800 fatalities and serious injuries. So we had over 2,700 uh, serious injuries. And when we looked at what we call our high injury network, uh, looking at those six commissioner districts, uh, the numbers of fatalities and serious injuries that were occurring on fairly short segments of roadway, we're talking about a mile and a half or two miles potentially, accounted for between 28 and 79 percent of all the fatalities and serious injuries in each of these commissioner districts. And that was very telling for a number of reasons. Uh, these, these commissioner districts where we had the highest challenges were in our communities of concern. Uh, and also uh, over, uh, over 80 percent of them were on the state road system. And as Beth rightfully pointed out, these are all six, uh, four and six lane high speed corridors uh, passing through uh, in many places, uh, numbers of apartment complexes on one side with retail on the other side. So this is a combination, the challenge is a combination of uh, transportation trying to accommodate every trip on the roadways in, in combination with land development patterns that uh, support higher speed travel through, through the corridors. Uh, and as part of that goal, you can see that we uh, developed a number of goals uh, we we uh, realized that we had to significantly change our approach to street design operations and maintenance on the, on the system, and we would have to work with the Florida DOT to address those concerns on, uh, on our system specifically. And I just want to highlight the value of uh, Vision Zero. We've worked uh, during my time at the department. Our focus had been really on trying to reduce crashes, and that's uh, if you're going to really uh, have a big impact on reducing fatalities and serious injuries, you really need to take a safe systems or vision zero approach uh, to doing that because there's just so much ground to cover in, in any jurisdiction to try to reduce crashes. And you're not necessarily, by reducing crashes, you're not necessarily going to reduce fatalities and serious injuries. So uh, this is something that I think is really important for the audience to think about and consider, especially as you're trying to improve things in your area. And Vision Zero started overseas, you can see back in the late 90s, and you can see that these, uh, these places have reduced uh, their fatalities and serious injuries by significant numbers. Excuse me for that. Uh, and likewise, the cities, the early adopters of Vision Zero in the United States, like San Francisco and New York City, have also achieved double-digit reductions in fatalities and serious injuries, which is why both Federal Highway and Florida Department of Transportation, many cities in the state of Florida, are now moving in the direction of, of doing a safe systems or Vision Zero approach. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. We'll have lots of times for Q&A and turn it over to Secretary Amishikan. Tokes. Thanks, Billy. Hopefully everybody can, uh, can hear me pretty well. Uh, good to join, excited to join this webinar. And it's good to see you, uh, Billy, and to see uh, Beth as well. Uh, I don't know if you both remember, speaking of having to work together in the past, the three of us were uh, in Hawaii, I don't know how many years ago it was now, to help uh, Hawaii DOT with work around how to become more multimodal as well. So we've got a long history to get a bet that I've known for more than a decade and Billy for roughly the same amount of time. So it's good to join, uh, good to join you both uh, on this panel and uh, Ian, uh, Ashton and Kate as well. Thank you for the work that you do for America Walks. I've known Ian probably for more than 20 years. Uh, our work goes back to the active living by design days uh, from the Robert, Robert Johnson Foundation and the city of Nashville. So, Excited to join this uh, this great panel uh, today. So uh, to start off things, I, I think what America Walks wanted me to talk about, um, I've been on the board for a decade now, roughly a decade. What they wanted me to talk about was 
how the issues around uh, bike pet safety and multimodalism, how it's played a role uh, in my career up to this point uh, to become Secretary of Transportation uh, for, for California. Um, and it's been at the center of it. It's been completely tied to it. And I probably wouldn't be here um, in this responsibility without uh, the, the successes and some failures, uh, successes that I've been able to achieve everywhere I've gone uh, through in my career by focusing primarily on how to become more multimodal, but doing it in a, in a safe way. So I started off my career uh, with the city of Nashville, the transportation side of my career, with the city of Nashville just a little over 20 years ago now. I was the first bicycle and pedestrian coordinator uh, in the entire state working, uh, working for the city. And at that time, uh, bike pet issues, active transportation issues were not a focus at all. It was not something that was heavily invested in. There were no policies. Um, it was just it, it, the public works department, if you will, was your typical public works uh, department at that time. Uh, this was, again, 20 years ago, you know, resurface streets uh, uh, and, and just work on typical, you know, public works related uh, project signals, things like that. And I was fortunate enough to be, again, a part of the active living by design movement from the Robert Johnson Foundation. Um, and had a very visionary mayor at the time who said, no, I want to make active transportation, building sidewalks, building bike lanes, connecting access to transit, uh, building more greenways and parks throughout the city. I want to make that something that the city is uh, focused on. And I, uh, I was fortunate and blessed enough to get that opportunity to help lead the city um, at that time. I worked for the city for 10 years. I left uh, the planning department where I started I went to go work for directly for the mayor of Nashville. Mayor uh, that I went to go work for at the time was Carl Dean. Same thing, blessed and fortunate enough to be working for a mayor who said, I want to be the greenest and healthiest city in the Southeast. And uh, I was appointed to lead uh, that effort by the mayor. Um, this is probably about 12 or 13 years ago now. Uh, eventually left that responsibility and moved to uh, TDOT. Uh, the Tennessee Department of Transportation, uh, and I led multimodal efforts there, uh, planning, um, uh, freight and logistics, um, and, uh, and, and other responsibilities that are very broad uh, portfolio, but I was Deputy Secretary, Deputy Commissioner um, at TDOT for, for eight years, um, and then eventually uh, got a chance to come and lead Caltrans here in California, uh, the, Depart the California Department of Transportation, and then uh, ultimately to become secretary. And the secretary responsibility is unique in, in California because you, I not only oversee the Department of Transportation, but also seven other departments in the state, including Highway Patrol, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, high, high Speed Rail, on and on and on. So there are eight total departments, uh, more than 40,000 people, more than 30, uh, more than $30 billion budget. Uh, but the key thing that I want people to just kind of remember is, as uh, um, uh, America walks um, and, and Ian asks me, uh, Ian asks me to share is along the way at each one of those responsibilities to get to this point, I made sure that we, from a policy standpoint and a resources standpoint, because that's where ultimately this this is going to make a difference for us. I made sure that um, we made significant changes. At the city government level, when I was at Nashville, uh, before I left, we put in place a complete streets executive order from the mayor's office. We also put in the highest amount of money ever in the city's history, investing in sidewalks, bike, uh, bike lanes, uh, and greenways, ever. We got to a point where the investments in those things, bike lanes, sidewalks, transit investments, and greenways, we got to a point where it was higher than any other investment that we were making in transportation. More than resurfacing, more than building new roads combined. So that was city government. When I got to state government at TDOT, similar thing. Uh, by 2018, we created something called a multimodal scoping plan um, that essentially said anytime we're scoping or developing a new project at TDOT, it was gonna go through uh, the lens uh, of a, uh, a complete streets uh, view. We called it multimodal. We didn't use the word complete streets much at TDOT. Multimodal scoping plan, we were, uh, document, we're gonna use it. 
uh, and also significant, significantly increased the dedicated funding uh, to uh, to uh, walking and, and biking and transit uh, at the state of Tennessee. Same thing here in California since I've been here. Uh, a, a executive policy put in place uh, that I put in place on a safe system approach uh, and also uh, a complete streets uh, policy uh, being put in place as well. But we've got a lot more work to do. Um, uh, we Our investments in active transportation in California are now up to $1.6 billion. That's how much we've put set aside now for active transportation in California. But even though we, we're up to that amount, you're still looking at uh, in your top 20 list, uh, Beth, uh, of the dangerous, uh, most dangerous places. Uh, four of those top 20 are uh, in California. I think only Florida has more cities in the top 20 than California does. And those four cities in California, uh, most of them are located roughly close to what you would consider the Central Valley. Um, and most people who live out this way know that uh, those are the places that are probably more economically challenged and has a lot of diversity than any other parts of California. So very much to your point about economics and, uh, and uh, demographics related to race, no surprise, uh, unfortunately, that our top four in California are um, in, in those uh, areas where economically and uh, from an uh, ethnicity and race standpoint um, have, uh, have seen a lot of challenges in the past. So um, uh, hopefully that summarizes things a little bit, uh, a little bit of my trajectory to become Secretary of Transportation in California um, and how much uh, we're focused on. I'd love to talk some more about some, some more things that we're doing here. Uh, with that, I want to hand things back to my friend Ian. Uh, to, to keep things going in a discussion with, with Ashton. Thanks, Ian. I, Ian, you're on, on mute. Thank you, Tokes, for po pointing that out. And thanks for your uh, opening remarks, as well as uh, Billy and Beth, thanks for yours. And uh, welcome, Ashton. Thanks for being here. And I'd love to just start by asking you what you took away from those opening comments of our panelists. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Beth, Billy, and Tokes for uh, those wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, you know, these are issues that I think we all are seeing nationwide. Uh, but here are a few key points that I observed through all three of those. Number one, income and economics matter. Uh, they play a huge role and a part in who is impacted by traffic violence. And is a uh, national problem due to antiquated and uh, transportation policies. Uh, we see that the same road uh, uh, types, four and six lane arterials uh, here in Portland and other places in Oregon as well. And then uh, the big one for me is other developed countries. Uh, have uh, impacts and increased their fatalities in a significant way, uh, which I'm not um, Ashton, your feed seems to have broken up a bit. Am I correct, Kate, that it's Ashton's feed, not mine? That's correct. Ashton, try again. I think I think your uh, connection has improved again. Okay, uh, where did I, I leave off at? Sorry. Uh, you you had mentioned that you have four and six lane arterials up in up in Oregon, and you had mentioned the demographics around unsafe roads. Right, right, and I, I guess the, the the last piece for me is uh, other developed countries have uh, reduced their fatalities uh, significantly. Uh, and, and other places where uh, we see affluence, we see um, uh, uh, folks and communities that are uh, uh, built out. So uh, curious to know how that's working um, and how we can adopt some of that in uh, some of our strategies and uh, reducing our fatalities. Well, well, let me bounce that right back to you, Ashton. You've been very active as a, a advocacy leader in the Portland area for many years. What are you pushing for in terms of addressing these unsafe roads? Absolutely. Number one is design, which I'm glad we're talking about that today. 
uh, particularly um, a lot of the arterials here in, in Oregon, uh, in Portland, uh, excuse me, are centered around. So like, how do we include the best safe routes to school designs from raised crossings to improve lighting, uh, rapid flashing beacons, things like that, but also with the urgency and the intentionality around uh, showing up in communities that are, again, low income or communities of color. And I, 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 I stir away from the term communities of to use the, the, the moniker uh, trauma impacted communities, because these are communities that are impacted by trauma day in and day out from traffic to gun violence to uh, addiction and other things. So uh, that, that's where my mind goes. Great. Thank you very much, Ashton. Uh, I'd love to ask uh, Tokes, Billy and Beth, if you could put your cameras back on and we'll move into uh, kind of more of a discussion. And I want to kick things off with a direct question and I'll start with you, Beth. Is it possible to engineer roads for both safety and speed? Yes, it is. And we see it on our interstates. Uh, if you, well, we actually knew way back in the 1950s when we started building the interstate that we wanted to build roadways that would accommodate speedy vehicle travel. But we knew then that putting speedy vehicle travel through communities where there are cross streets and driveways and bicyclists and pedestrians would be a recipe for disaster. So we'd never do that. Instead, we built a system of separated roadways that are not only separated from the local roadway system and development and driveways and parking lots and, uh, and, and side street parking and all that sort of thing, but it was separate, the oncoming traffic was separated from each other. And there was a lot of much wider lanes and a lot more space on either side so that people mm -hmm. going fast could make a mistake and recover. The problem mm -hmm. is we then forgot that we needed to keep that speed separate and stuck it back in exactly the place we removed it from because in the 1950s, we knew that would be straight out stupid. Billy, uh, anything to add to Beth's answer or um, alternative take? Sure. So, so Florida, like most of the Sun Belt cities, grew up after World War II in between land development patterns and the increased demand to drive for people to get back and forth from work to home, you know, the, and, and com combine that with the federal funding and state funding that, that was focused really on moving cars from, from area to area. Uh, and so all of us, especially in the South, have ended up with these four and six lane roadways. And at the department, there's been a lot of things done from an engineering and education standpoint to change design going forth. Uh, I've been gone for uh, seven years, but it takes major projects five to seven years to get built. Uh, but the department has done a lot uh, to try to address this problem in the interim. And I'll give you a couple of examples. They, they uh, in November of last year, they uh, approved a standard for raised crosswalks that could be used on the state system. That's something that had never been done before. Uh, the, the area that Orlando is located in, where I worked at the city of Orlando, one of our high injury network was Orange Blossom Trail. Uh, they will be finishing up their design this year that, that uh, installs raised crosswalks on a six lane roadway, along with ped pedestrian hybrid beacons to force drivers down to 15 to 20 miles an hour so that, uh, so that pedestrians have a much more safe crossing. Mm -hmm. uh, the department has used context as the basis for street design going forward. We reduce the minimum design speed from 40 to 25 miles an hour. Uh, and now they're in the process of working on updating their speed zoning and they'll be using uh, the 50th percentile to set speed limits on high injury networks in communities, but also in, in the higher context classes, the more urban context class. So that's just a couple of examples uh -huh. that I'm aware of uh, as we continue to work with DOT. In addition to the, the training that they're doing on Vision Zero and safe systems and actually funding uh, local agencies uh, to go funding local agencies in the development of Vision Zero Action Plans for their communities, which they intend mm. to work with them on then. And, and um, that is relatively unusual for the, for the DOT to 
uh, allow raised crosswalks on their arterials, because I hear from a lot of uh, advocates around the country who uh, have asked about that from their different state DOTs and been told that that's not going to be possible. Um, what's the California story, Tokes? Yeah, uh, so I like Beth's response about uh, the interstate example, but I actually think I think those things can be mutually exclusive. So my response is it depends. It depends. I, I think the data is clear. It shows that the higher speeds are, the more uh, the, the more serious injuries you're likely to have, or you know fatalities also increase. I think the number is for every ten miles you increase the speed on the roadway, it doubles the chance of uh, someone either you know being seriously injured or having have enough fatality on the roadway so it, it it really it really depends it works for an interstate but it definitely doesn't work for an arterial if you if if you look at arterials that are designed for 25 miles an hour and you compare them to arterials that are designed for 55 miles an hour and you compare the serious injury rates and the fatality rates on both of those it will be starkly clear to you that on 55 miles an hour, you're going to have higher uh, incidences or crashes than on 25 miles an hour. So it's almost inherent that when you when you increase speeds, that happens. But uh, to Beth's point, if you have if you compare there have been studies done that compare the autobahn in Germany to the interstates in America, the autobahn people are saying, you know, most of the studies show. Is, is actually safer, even though the speeds are significantly higher than what we have here. So design is really, really important. And the way they've designed the autobahn, even though it's just this you know, racetrack, if you will, even the way they've designed it is there are a lot of conflict points and barriers that end up on the interstate system in the United States that are not on the system there. They completely clear it out. So even though it's very high speeds, not a lot of the same uh, issues as far as street furnishings and you know trees and things that you know people you know can run off the road and, and run into. So design is absolutely critical. So I'm giving you a, a weird answer here, but it depends, is what what I would say. Well, well, you know, I want to add to that with this question, and and you started hitting on it a bit, Totes, because uh, last year when we published our report. Uh, one of the things we looked at, uh, at Oregon, as Oregon Walks was uh, the top three things that cause fatalities is uh, poor lighting, high speeds, and lane widths. And so, the, and I, I'll let Billy start us with the design parameters of arterials that make them so deadly. Yeah, so it, again, going back to the state where I've, where I've worked and continue to work as a consultant, um, so we, we did discover as part of our safety initiative, we, we worked with, with universities. And one of the things we found out on the pedestrian safety issue is the high pressure sodium lighting that's used that's been used in Florida on, on our state roads and, and actually a lot of communities before LEDs came into play. We found out through that process, two things. One is that the high pressure sodium lighting after five or six years of being in service, the lighting actually getting on the ground was around 10 to 15%. So you may have a light fixture, but that doesn't mean there's actually any lighting on the roadway. So that was, that was one element that we found out. The second thing we found out through this effort is that while the state road crosswalks were well lit, from a design perspective, the crossing streets were dark in many, many cases. So as a result of that, uh, when, when I was part of the secretary's leadership team during our program planning workshop, we took $100 million off of the top of our work program and dedicated it towards improving safety at our most dangerous intersections throughout the state of Florida. And that was that construction should be done by now because we had about five years to get that in place. Uh, and that should improve uh, lighting at over, at about 80% of the intersections is what we were in, uh, expecting. Likewise, when we implemented complete streets, we went from a standard 12 foot lane, regardless of the context of the built environment to 10, 11 and 12. So in a downtown or in an urban, in a place that's redeveloping more urban, the designers now have the, not just the freedom, but the ex expectation that they're going to, des to design those streets in the context 
of the adjacent land development patterns. And not just for existing conditions, but also if a community wants to redevelop a corridor on the state road system, as they're able to fix their land development patterns, the DOT will change the design criteria on that section of roadway, which gives, which gives us more freedom to, to implement more aggressive treatments to reduce speed and therefore safety. Because again, we want to reduce fatalities and serious injuries in significant numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Beth, would you like to chime in on that? Uh, I would. I, you know, I think one of the things we really need to keep in mind is how hostile this whole system is to the driver. We're theoretically building all this for the convenience of the driver. Now, when we say that, we mean we built you a really inconvenient community where everything you need is super far away from you. So we'll try to make it up for you by letting you drive real fast. But that's not, not creating convenience. It's, it's uh, a half answer. But when you're driving fast, uh, a, a lot of things can be really confusing. I, I was just in a, an engagement where uh, people, locals, going through a particular area uh, complained of how confusing it was for them to figure out where they were supposed to be in a car in an area they knew well uh, at the speed that they were expected to go. Um, it, there's only so much information you can take in at one time. And it's why when you're on uh, a limited access highway, we space out that information. There's only so many signs. Those signs need to be standardized. There's a certain size font. There's a certain placement. It's all because we know when you're going fast, there's a way to supply information to you. We don't have an exit every 20 feet. We have an exit every mile. These are the sorts of things that make it easier for a driver to pull in the right information and behave well at speed. When you put them in the middle of a city and tell them everyone around you is going to be going fast, it's too much. And you're giving them conflicting information. Two examples. Think about the word speed trap. Every driver in America knows what a speed trap is, which means we have a serious design problem in this country. A speed trap is when the driver is given a roadway that feels appropriate to drive fast on, but the speed limit is marked way lower than would be natural for you to drive on. That's a big nasty trick on the driver, which we pull all across the country. And yet we a lot of people try to pretend there's no design issue. Second example, those right-hand turn lanes, uh, often referred to as slip lanes, where you can uh, turn right without stopping for the light. It's designed for you to be able to go fast as a driver along your turn, but then in the middle of it is a crosswalk. So we're telling the driver, go fast, stop, go fast, stop. And if you get that wrong, because you can't do both things at one time, then it's user error. There's a bunch of things that we're doing that are really unfair to the driver and create jeopardy for those both in and outside of a car. I do wanna point out, dangerous by design is focusing on the pedestrian, but uh, driver and occupants of a vehicle uh, were in much greater danger in 2020 and 2021 too. You know, Beth, you, you, you brought up a good concern there. We often hear, and I, this is a, probably another conversation or topic for another day, but uh, the barriers for our elders, our aging citizens, uh, to get to and from places and, and the need for age-friendly communities that are uh, a little bit closer in so that they can walk to and get to the things that they need to. Uh, we often hear about the barriers it takes to drive to get to one place to the other to, you know, get the things that they need for their quality of life. So uh, very, very good topics. Uh, again, age-friendly is one we could talk about all day and another day. So uh, I'll move on. Uh, I'll let Ian uh, shoot the next question. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ashton. Um, so design speed has been mentioned a couple of times, and I'd like to just dig a little more into that. Um, clearly, the width of a road, how curvy it is, the sight lines, um, how you know complicated the, the um, land use to the side <laughs> is going to have an impact on how fast people drive. Um, and yet it seems that we have roads that have been designed for speeds that we don't want people to drive at that are too fast. So Tokes, let me start with you. Can you opine on how that happened? 
but also on uh, what are the, some of the specific interventions to reconfigure the roads so that they do uh, promote a lower speed from drivers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, how it happened, um, I think most of us in the industry now, I think we're, we're aware uh, that we came through an era where uh, the auto industry sort of completely took over mobility in our country for the last 60 or 70 years. And I don't want to paint the auto industry as a bad guy. We need automobiles. All of us do. They're part of our lives in, in one way or another, either for goods or for people movement. So don't, don't, don't get me wrong in some of my comments here. But through those, over the last 60 or 70 years, we also saw uh, the size of these automobiles increase. And it's something that when we talk about, Billy mentioned a few times, a safe system approach. When we talk about a safe system approach, it also includes not only design and behavioral side of things, but the automobile itself. And we've gone to a, gotten to a point where, especially through the 1990s, we saw the, the, the highest increase of usage of what we now call SUVs than ever before. We just saw the, the, them sort of infiltrate the market and we have bigger and bigger vehicles than we've ever had before uh, in, in the history of the, this country. I remember when, and I'm again, not picking on a particular uh, industry here, but I remember when excursions first came out. I don't know if you guys know what those are, but uh, it's an SUV. I don't, I'm not going to say the, the brand name, but um, it's, it, it's essentially a, a school bus, the size of a school bus that can go 85, you know, 100 miles an hour. Uh, and we got a bunch of these on the market now. They're all over. So with that, over the years, we also said bigger roads, bigger lane widths as well. So to the first part of your question, how did we get here? We need to get, I bet mentioned this, we need to get, our, our destinations are farther away. We need to get there farther because of the way land use is set up. So we got to get there as fast as we can. So we need to build, supposedly, the solution is build bigger roads and add bigger lanes. And we also have bigger vehicles. That recipe right there, you can see some of the results of what happens when you do that. Uh, some of the examples mentioned in the slide before from Beth, all those countries, that didn't happen there. That didn't happen. They didn't go in and start building bigger roads and bigger lanes and have bigger cars. That didn't happen. So to your point about, I think the, the latter part about your question, Ian, was what are some of the things that can be done? Uh, we also know what those are now today. Uh, they're very clear. The, the experts that you have here, they've worked on these issues for years. Uh, if it's an intersection, uh, think about bulb outs, if pedestrians are going to be using it. Think about roundabouts. Think about pedestrian refuges. Uh, add sidewalks. Add crosswalks. All these things, but make sure it's well lit. All these things make a significant difference mm -hmm. in improving mobility for multiple users. And reducing the speed of the cars. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Billy, anything to add to that? Sure, uh, I, I'd be happy to. So, and, and again, this goes to, to the situation we have in most of the Sunbelt states. Um, when, when you had federal and state funding, funding for travel demand, and in combination with local governments allowing cul-de-sacing of, of uh, development projects, whether it's a subdivision or commercial development, and really, placing all of the demand for traffic movement through the region on the state and federal highway. That was a significant trick contributor to how things got the way that they have gotten in, in, in the state of Florida and in most of the states that I've worked as well. And, and I can share with you uh, just a brief example. We've, we've worked on, and we continue to be heavily focused on safety where I work now. And so we did some analysis of a half a dozen communities one of which has no, no four-lane roadways, no signals. This is in Orlando, it's called Baldwin Park. And we compared that with similar projects throughout the state and, and nationally that had similar development patterns, but were not, uh, were not gridded as well and had very few connections to the outside, outside the community. 
And in, in we found in all those cases, they had four lane, typically four lane roadways passing through their development. Uh, and, and because they're four lane, they were all high speed. And, and in Baldwin Park, we had no fatalities and serious injuries over the time frame that we studied. And all of these other developments had, had fatalities, numbers of fatalities and serious injuries because they had four, four lane roadways uh, that, that contributed or, or encouraged higher speed driving through the development patterns. So, mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's how we got uh, to where we are in Florida. We have most of our development is a suburban sprawl, cul-de-sac onto the arterial system, and, and local agencies can help by not continuing those land development patterns and, and putting surface parking lots in the front and setting buildings way back. But it takes, it takes a village to, to solve these problems. So lots of design um, ideas there, which all make a lot of sense. Beth, you're uh, in the advocacy sphere. What are some of the political challenges with getting local uh, governments to adopt the kind of approaches Billy and Tokes are talking about? Oh, I mean, there are so many, but I mean, one of the biggest ones is it's very hard for people to conceive of the built environment around them changing. There's a certain security in believing that the buildings and the concrete around you will always be the same. And here we come, we sidle on up and say everything around you is water. It's fiction. It could change tomorrow. And that's an unsettling concept. In fact, it's true. Uh, communities are changing all the time right in front of our eyes. And, and there's a way to back people into that and recognize it's going to change. The question is, are we going to manage it or is it going to happen to us? But that takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. That really means outreach and conversations with people. The single greatest way I've ever seen uh, to address that is to do things temporarily. Just go and do some, some things with paint and with some bollards and some planters. Billy did that with us, a demonstration project in Orlando uh, with, with a bunch of paint and temporary uh, interventions, and then brought the public in and got them to experience it and feel it and recognize that it could have some real benefit. Or if they didn't like it, they didn't say, I don't like it out of fear. They said some, they could talk specifically about a design that they didn't like and be parts of creating something new. California is now working on us on uh, with three communities in the state on some demonstration projects. So I think that's big. And the mm -hmm. second big area I'd say is just the way we do things. There's such a bias since most of our program grew up in the interstate era to apply interstate standards and highway standards to every single roadway. And we focus so much on throughput um, in spite of the fact that throughput on a lot of these local streets aren't particularly good for the economy, and you never get good throughput in an area where you have traffic lights all the way down. The, the notion that you've built something for thr throughput, but they're going to stop for 60 seconds every half, every half mile is silly. It's this notion that we're going to kind of, uh, you know, as Chuck Marone with Strong Town says, we're going to create this futon. This, this highway slash local street hybrid, which ends up doing both poorly, like a futon is a bad bed and a bad sofa. <laughs> um, but then I think the other thing is in uh. focusing so much on throughput, um, we do two things that are three things that are really foolish. One is throughput for who? Roadways mm. that move people in and out of their car actually have significantly better throughput than the ones that are only focusing on SOV travel. Two, mm is uh, throughput often pushes more development further out, which lengthens your trip or requires you to go out of your way. Think about that roadway where there's no left turn all the way down. That's great for throughput. It just doesn't get you where you're going. It could lengthen your trip. So now you've got a delay in your trip because we've lengthened it. And the last thing it does is keeping people at high speed, especially in a complex environment, is more likely to lead to crashes and that's going to lower throughput. So, so much of what underlies what we're trying to do, the point is off and what we're getting is just totally disconnected from what we're trying to do. Yeah, the theory is, is misconstrued. Running and, up against reality. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've had a lot of questions from the audience. Thanks so much. I want to quickly address one of those. And then uh, Ashton, I'll hand over to you for our final question. Uh, Billy, uh, let me pass this one to you. Can you talk a little more about how to design 
safe and effective crosswalks on, you know, high speed arterials? Sure. Well, I mean, from my perspective, and this why this is why I think the state has introduced the raised crosswalk. When you have a situation in suburbia and you had these large intersections, four and six lane intersections where, where both roads are four or six lanes, uh, you've got to get the speeds down. And so it's, you know, it may be difficult for some people to accept, and I'm sure they're going to have some challenges with OBT once it's opened back up. But the fact is, uh, and I wish contrary to Beth's comment about signals being a minute, <laughs> they're, they're usually more like two to four minutes in the state mm -hmm. of Florida. So you actually have much more delay from signals than you do from reducing speed. So getting the speeds down uh, by using raised crosswalks is that and, and modern roundabouts are really one of the, or really some of the most effective tools if you want to get safety uh, improved at intersections. I, I talked about lighting before, uh, having improved lighting um, and making sure it's designed properly so that the pedestrian is lit uh, from the front, uh, facing the driver instead of behind the driver. Uh, and there, there are other tools that can be put in place, uh, adjusting signal timings to manage speeds through the corridor. And you do have to have fairly short uh, intersection spacings in order to achieve that in a meaningful way. But there are, there are some tools in place using bulb outs to reduce the crossing distance. Uh, that we have a lot of corridors that are over capacity, either because the travel demand moved to a freeway or a toll road, uh, using road diets uh, are, are a very effective way to improve things at intersections, not just for, for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists, but for motorists as well. And Tokes, how about mid-block? Anything mm. that can be done to reduce speeds mid-block or provide crossing opportunities? Yeah, mid blocks are, as we know, mid blocks generally are a challenge. Uh, but uh, one of the solutions that I think have been highlighted more and more lately are, are flashing beacons. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to locations where, for example, like a university campus where people often are not going to want to walk up to an intersection across, there's a lot of sort of mid block crossing because of the way, you know, a, a campus or that the land use is in a particular area set up, uh, you know, having a flashing beacon uh, with a crosswalk there um, that you can, uh, you know, you you can push the button and if you're not people are not familiar with it, it's easy to look up uh, online uh, to be able to help get people across uh, and meet it in the middle of the the roadway is is one of the solutions that I think has been effective lately. All right, thank you for that. So uh, last question, rapid fire, uh, 20 seconds at best, go. Uh, what's your advice for applicants who want to be a part of the solution? You broke up a little uh, bit, Ashton. Uh, Could you repeat that? Uh, sorry, I said, what's your, what's your advice for advocates who want to be part of the solution? I'll, I'll be happy to speak up on that. Uh, get your locals to adopt a Vision Zero Action Plan, Adopt, uh, identify your high injury network. And I can tell you in the state of Florida, when state when locals have done that, it gives the department the, the opportunity to use more aggressive action, including putting in additional mid-block crosswalks because it's on the high injury network. So I would encourage your locals to pursue a safe systems or Vision Zero approach. Thank you. Uh, Beth? Show up at city council meetings, public meetings. The people who oppose change will always be there and always be loud. We have a heck of a time getting the supporters out there. You want to show up and balance off the voices of people that never want things to change. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Totes, round us out. Yeah, three things. Uh, push for policy and regulatory change, whether it be Vision Zero, safe systems approach, whatever it is, what's unique for your, what's best for your community. Resources, you need resources. Uh, you need dollars to invest in this. And you also need people, coordinators, whatever it may be, staff that can focus on this in your jurisdiction. And finally, be resilient, be mm -hmm. resilient, stick with it. Don't give up on this because it means a lot to, to the people of your community. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, thank you all. And uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Ian. Go ahead, Ian. <laughs>
Thank you, Ashton. Thanks so much, Tokes, Billy, and Beth, for sharing your expertise and your experience with us today. Uh, it's been an engaging discussion. Thank you, Ashton, for your participation and support with the uh, uh, with all the questions and your interpretation of the opening remarks. And thank you, Kate, for um, uh, running all of the technology in the background and keeping everything flowing smoothly. Um, and thanks to you, our attendees, for participating in this webinar. Uh, and if you would like to do donate to America Walks to support this work, then please click on that link, which uh, Kate has just put back in the, in the chat room there, uh, where you can make a donation. So this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and we will have an announcement about next month's webinar soon. Thanks very much for being here, and have a great afternoon.